Hey everybody, welcome to part two of five of this amazing extensive reading conversation series that I filmed with Jared Turner. I'll introduce him again in the video, but last week we talked about Jared's story and how extensive reading can help you develop spoken fluency as well as other language skills. And today we're gonna to be giving you a clearer definition of extensive reading. Next week we'll talk about how to get started and measure your progress with extensive reading. There's just so much value packed into these five conversations. So I hope you enjoy it. And for people on Patreon who support me at my page, just so you know, I uploaded the bonus portion of this conversation where Jared and I went through and we answered all the questions that the Patreon supporters asked. If you want the opportunity to ask questions to future interview guests of mine, I have some amazing people lined up for the next few months and next year. So please go to the link in the description and join my wonderful Patreon community. But without further ado, happy Friday everybody and let's jump in to the video. Hey everybody, welcome back, happy Friday. And again, we have our conversation series with Jared Turner. How you doing, Jared? I am doing fantastic. Glad to hear that. And you know what? I'm excited because this is the second part of this conversation series. Last week, we talked all about Jared's own story with extensive reading and how it impacted his language learning in the case of Mandarin Chinese. It was really cool. So if you haven't seen it already, I recommend checking it out. Jared's an awesome guy. He is the co-founder of Mandarin Companion, which is a graded reader series, um, which he created with John Pasden. And so, like I said, if you haven't seen that first video, I recommend you check it out. But now we're gonna move on to what is extensive reading? How does it differ from perhaps intensive reading or just reading in general? I wanna hear the whole thing. Let's jump in. All right, well, thanks for that, Robin. So what is extensive reading? I, I, I guess that's what we're talking about. That um, is it. Okay, well, uh, you know, extensive reading, it's an approach to language learning, which involves reading a lot at a high level of comprehension and reading books that you enjoy and that you choose. So, I mean, that's, that's the baseline, but it, obviously it's a much deeper subject than that. And I guess we can really delve into that. Yeah, let's do it. Um... So yeah, so first of all then, how does extensive reading differ from like intensive reading? Yeah, well, I usually we bring up that there's kind of three basic levels of reading. So you usually kind of start at the bottom. So the bottom one would be uh, reading pain. So this is reading below a 90% level of comprehension. So, I mean, if you think about it, some people say, oh, 90%, that's good enough. Um, well, Really? I mean, think about it. If you if we were having a conversation or anyone listening, if you can only understand 90 percent of what we're, we're talking about, that's 10 percent that you don't know. And usually that's going to be some of those key words and concepts that are just kind of like, well, what is going on? You got a really hard time keeping up. So that's like one in 10 words that are unknown. And this is even and, you know, my expertise is Robin is in Chinese, but uh, it's even worse in Chinese because, you know, you come across characters you don't know. I mean, it's it's like a black hole. It's just you don't know it. Uh, you know, if it's Spanish or French or something, at least you can sound it out. Right. But um, but yeah, reading below 90 percent comprehension is typically it's slow. It's demotivating. Your reading comprehension suffers. Uh, you know, at this stage, it's a reason it's called reading pain is that you just don't learn as much. You don't. I mean, you we've I'm sure we've all done this, right? You you spend like uh, you got a paragraph that you're trying to read through. You take a half an hour to get through it or maybe a couple of paragraphs. And by the time you get to the end, you're not even sure what you read. <laughs> you're like, what, what was that all about anyway? You know, you got notes everywhere, little definitions, you know. And so it's 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 not I mean, can you learn this way? Yes, you can. Uh, but it is not optimal uh, and it's, it's difficult and it's kind of a slog. Um, so then we go between 90 to 98 percent comprehension. We usually do refer to this as intensive reading. And so intensive reading, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a higher level of comprehension. It's best done when you have a dictionary. Uh, it's even better when you can do this guided reading, which you have someone like uh, a more proficient speaker, 
usually a teacher or tutor or a native speaker reading along with you or, or following along with you and helping you when you come to the spots you don't you're not familiar with. Um, but this is we're more used to this as like the text you might find in a, in a textbook, like as like, a you know, an article or paragraph at the end of a chapter. And it has a lot of new keywords in it, maybe some you studied, maybe some you didn't. And um, so that's kind of intensive reading. And it is helpful. We, we, you can learn the language and it's definitely better than uh, reading pain, uh, reading pain level. But uh, the extensive level is what researchers have found is like the reading sweet spot. This is where you you want to read. You will, you will experience the most gains at this level. And that's at a 98 percent level of comprehension. And a lot of people say that that's that's way high. You know, I'm not in you know, I'm not even going to be encounter like there's so many words I know. You know, I'm not going to be encountering that many words. Well, let's do some simple math here. OK, All right. So let's say you're reading an extensive level. And uh, I'm just going to take into account English because there's a lot of the research around, you know, learning English for extensive reading. Uh, if you're reading at 100 words a minute and you're reading an extensive level, you should be encountering what two uh, percent of those words you don't know. So you might encounter two words in one minute that you don't know. If you're reading at an intensive level, that should maybe five out of 100 words. And then if you're reading a reading pain level, you're about 10 out of 100 words you don't know. But at the reading pain level, you're not reading 100 words a minute. You're going to be reading, if you're lucky, like about 10 words a minute. Think about how long it takes you to just simply open up the dictionary and look something up or hover over and you know maybe take a note, go back and reread the sentence and everything. Really, you'll find you're reading a very low level, low, low speed. And then you go on the intensive level, you're going to be reading a little bit faster, but still we find that you know, you're going to be reading maybe you know, 20 words a minute something like that. Um, and so what's kind of happening at that extensive level is that sometimes, depending on your actual reading speed, you may encounter more words, more unknown words in a minute, uh, but you're going to encounter them at a higher level of comprehension and in more context. So you got all the paragraphs around it that you understand, and it just it helps boost your fluency. And, and even though you know, you've got, uh, you're encountering some new words. It's not just about learning new words. And we know that, right, Robin? It's not just about like, how many new words can you get in your brain? Yeah. I mean, if that's what it was, we just study flashcards ad nauseum and memorize dictionaries. But just because you memorize a dictionary doesn't mean you know how to speak the language. Yeah. I often it's say, a, if I may just quickly interject that a lot of what I do, whether it's in reading or just general studies, most of the notes I write down are things I already knew how to say. There's, they were in there somewhere, right? And I've shown recently a lot of my strategies for taking notes with studying various language apps. I've also shown my um, Mandarin Chinese notes from even some, some reading, where I'll go back after I've read the chapter and I might just take a few notes. Most of it is stuff I actually understood, but I'm like, ah, I, I didn't know you could say it that way. Or, or it's like, I'm, try, I'm solidifying things that I knew, but I, it's shaky, right? Um, and even aside from that, most of the benefit that I got from reading Emma, I got some new words and that was great. But most of what I got was just reinforcing those hundreds and maybe even thousands of words that I have covered, but that in a conversation, I'm like, ah, what's that word, you know, and that was just exactly. a huge benefit. And because the, we were coming to like, you, you bring up the, the whole host of issues, of, of things that, you know, <laughs> right. we can talk about here. It's because it's really like, what does it mean to be fluent? You know, what 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 is it really do you need for proficiency in the language? And it's much more than just knowledge because there's knowledge versus proficiency in something. And so when we're talking about reading at this extensive level, we're not just talking about learning new words. We're talking about proficiency in a language. Right. And so let's let's talk about some of these things you're bringing up, Robin, because it's very important. OK, so. One of the things we do know, what research finds, is that the average word, you need to meet or encounter that word 20 to 50 times before it to be learned, recep learned receptively, okay? So, and, and if it's an abstract word or something that's, you know, very, you know, like maybe it's just a or... grammatical particle or something like that, it could take like hundreds or thousands of meetings before it's like really like in your brain. But that doesn't account for like this deeper level of learning. OK, and so the, not a lot of research has been done about this is about like we're talking about that there's called collocations, colligations, lectural phrases. And, and so I'm going to go into that. But what these are is it's like, OK, so 
we're talking about one of the things like word pairs. Okay, so colligations, collocations, that's not, word pairs is probably the most uh, vernacular term for it. But we just think about like, uh, one good example is the word idea in English. So uh, how can you use that word? So you can use abandon an idea. You can be obsessed with an idea, struck by an idea, formulate an idea, grasp an idea, you know, endorse an idea, entertain an idea. You can toy with an idea. Anyway, the list goes on and on. And there's literally like hundreds of different word pairs that go with idea. And there are some that just don't. And how are you going to learn those? Yeah. And every language has it. You know, it's in Chinese, French, you know, Polish, whatever it is, they will all have word pairs as part of it. Yeah. It's just part of the language. And then there's all sorts of things like lexical phrases, which these are just, you know, like things you say, like, uh, you know, I'd rather not. Or if it were up to me. Uh, you know, let's go jump into the shower. You know, I, I'm going to jump into the shower. The British, uh, I quite fancy that. I quite fancy, I fancy that, a yes. <laughs> yeah, <that's all. laughs> or who do you fancy? Right? I pretty much you know? always fancy a cup of coffee, which everyone knows on this channel. But yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there's all these little set phrases that you kind of need to know. And how are you going to encounter those? You don't learn those typically from dictionary. And and the thing about it is a textbook, there's no possible way it can teach you every single one. And if they did, you're learning on its abstract. How does it really fit into a conversation? You're only going to see that through exposure to the language. And that can come through a lot of listening or reading. And for most people listening here, uh, most people just they're, they're don't have that luxury or opportunity to go live in their target, uh, in the country where their target language is being spoken. And there's a great researcher. She's uh, Christine Nuttolf. She's from Cambridge University. She says... The best way to learn a language is to go live among the speakers. The next best way is to read extensively in the language. And so, but, you know, getting back on track here, there's the other things, the grammar, right? The, the, and, you know, one of, my, uh, one of my favorite examples of this, I know you had him on your show before, Steve Kaufman, right? And Steve Kaufman speaks in you know, roughly 20 languages. And, you know, he says, I never study grammar. Uh, he says, I try to get enough familiar with the language, and then I just kind of get out there and speak and get a lot of exposure to it. And, and that's that's a great approach because you know, when we study grammar, these are rules, but they're kind of learned abstractly. Uh, and, but grammar is patterns. And, and extensive reading is one of the best ways to acquire grammar because when you start seeing these patterns over and over again at a comprehensible level, they just repeat, repeat, and then it just starts to kind of imprint in your mind. It's just like grammar in your own language. You know, you just can you explain the grammar point. Uh, sometimes you don't think about it. It's like it's like, you know, fish swimming in water and, and the fish don't even know water exists, you know, <laughs> and it's it's just it's just there and you can't explain it. It's just that's the way it is, you know. Right. So the grammar just becomes acquired naturally when you start getting on extensive reading. Um, and so. There's some of these, there's just a lot of things that extensive reading and reading at an extensive level does for language development. It affects all these other aspects. And, you know, it's just one of these things. Think about when you have a dictionary or something, you just have a little example sentence on how it's, that's supposed to be used. Well, well, how about having, you know, one of those, but an example book, <laughs> you know, has the key words and just everything in it. So you have a lot of context to draw upon. It helps you understand the language. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And I find that um, the, the other thing that, you know, it's these sort of connecting words and conjunctions, right? Things like saying, and then, or but, or although, or there are so many of these. And so right now I have a lot of these in Mandarin. And I have found that uh, prior to reading, those are some of the words that are the, the most slippery. I, I often think of them of where like, I just forget. I see them over and over again. And even words like already or always, like you've already done that or you're always doing that. These little words and what I've found is, especially when it comes to speaking, oftentimes those little connector words that connect different parts of a sentence or different sentences entirely, they're often great pausing moments when you're speaking. Mm. And so when you say, but, that's a great opportunity to just give yourself a breather and think about the next thing. But if you can't remember but, then it's a, for me at least, it ramps up the stress. And so when I come into a conversation and I'm confident with these little sentence connecting words, with these little things here, got a couple collocations, couple phrases in my back pocket, you know, um, I actually remember an example of Steve Kaufman is kind of funny. It's very specific, but I used to listen to a podcast in French where he would chat to 
a guy named Henri, who was one of their programmers at Link. And <laughs> Steve would have all these little words he would use constantly, like, comment dirais-je, which is like, oh, how can I say it? Or like, oh, well, how can I put this? He would say it all the time, and I picked that up. And so I just think <laughs> reading reading is a great way to build your confidence, I think, with those little slippery words. Um, we could go on all day about this, I think. It's just, it's it's excellent. Is there anything else you want to talk about in this particular conversation? The next video, by the way, is going to be how to actually get started with uh, mm. extensive reading. And more importantly, well, so this, equally this as importantly, the theory. Yeah, and also how yeah, do you yeah. measure progress? Because that's something I don't hear spoken about enough. Do, do you want to talk about that right now, the progress? Um, so I was going to touch on that in the next video. Is there anything oh, okay, okay. else you want to say? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about comprehensible input. Oh, yeah, so, let's do it. So, you know, Ram, the, the whole core of this, it, it, it's, it hinges upon comprehensible input. And, and you know, we, we talked before about, you know, being able to practice your speaking and, you know, your listening and all these things. And, you know, really what I like about it is that, you know, we if you had a, like a little uh, diagram, a four by four box, two by two box uh, thing, you could just you can divide first off, you know, language into input and output. And you need to have enough input of the language. And so a lot of times we do talk about, you know, listening. And that's, it is, listening is important. We need to have listening. If you can't pronounce, you can't understand it. I mean, it's, you're not going to get very far. But you do need to have that reading component. And if you are not around a lot of other native speakers, reading is that excellent way to get that input that you need for your language development. Without enough input, you are not going to be able to model and, you know, actually effectively output language for communication. Right. And so that comprehensible input, if you guys have seen that term before, I mean, that is the watchword for language education. In fact, it's, it's, you could even say it's a, it's a watchword, you know, it's a, an underlying principle for all education. You know, we don't try to explain, you know, particle physics uh, to a toddler, right? That's not comprehensible to them. I mean, you know, I plan we, on teaching my toddler uh, a lot of particle <laughs> physics one day. Well, we can't. Speak you for know, yourself, Jared. Really, but, you know, they're not, they're not getting it, right? <laughs> you know, but it's the same thing is that, you know, you, you, you'd start out at basic classes, you gain interest in it, and you work your way up to more complex, uh, you know, things. Right. And that's the same thing about comprehensible input. We all know that because, you know, we have beginner levels and we work our way up to advanced levels. So you always want to try to get comprehensible input. And reading at a high level of comprehension at an extensive reading level, which is that target of like 98%, that's ideal. It's not always possible. You know, your target language may not have materials um, or there's always going to be leaps and gaps between, uh, you know, different levels. And sometimes you're going to be reading at a, 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 a reading pain level. But the point is, is that that's the ideal. That's where you want to go. And when you can get to that level, and that's where you're going to learn best. Can you learn through reading pain? Can you learn, you know, at a reading at a lower level of comprehension? Yes, you can. And I think, Robin, you've done that. <laughs> I have. <laughs> but, I have. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's better and you will learn faster and quicker uh, if you're reading at a high level of comprehension. Right. Yeah. And I do. I, I've been thinking a lot recently about this idea of sort of perfectionism when it comes to resources. Um, I've had a few things where, uh, you know, I've shown resources I use and then some people will say that's not perfect or like that's not, you know, what you really want is you want a book that would teach you all of the, you know, collocations and, con and but it's like, okay, well, I don't have that book. I have never seen that book. Right. And so sometimes you do have to make do what you have. But that's why I think we're so lucky to be learning languages today. And there are more and more companies like Mandarin Companion who are going out and creating content that's exactly what you probably want. Um, so when you, can, when you can get it, it's awesome. All right, well, that's, I think, it for this particular conversation. So just to recap, um, this video was all about, you know, what is extensive reading? Last time we talked about Jared's experience and how extensive reading helped boost his spoken Chinese dramatically. In the next video, next Friday, we're going to be talking all about how do you get started and how do you actually measure progress with extensive reading? So make sure to subscribe, come back, and also feel free to go and check out mandarincompanion.com. I'll also have an Instagram link in the description where Jared makes the best Mandarin Chinese memes. Um, but <laughs> without further ado, 
We'll say goodbye and see you back here next Friday. See you next time.